Good morning, church. How are you? Doing good? Wow. It's a lot of you. Hey, I want to tell you a story about Bob the Barber. Okay? Bob the Barber owned a barber shop. Bob the Barber was a Christian. One night, Bob the Barber decided he was going to go check out a tent revival they were having there in town. So Bob the Barber went to the tent revival and got all pumped up. He realized he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing as a, as a Christian. He wasn't sharing the gospel with other people. So at his local church, they happened to have what they called a witnessing class where you could go and learn how to share the gospel with people. It was a two-week class. He took it, and he was there every night, five nights a week for two weeks in a row, listening to the teachers, making a bunch of notes, memorizing scripture, learning how to get conversations started, learning the answers to, to the most posed uh, opposition questions to people when you're witnessing to them, all kinds of stuff. He was ready. At the end of two weeks, he got him a plaque that said he had graduated from that class. He took the plaque to his barbershop, and he hung it up in the, in, the, in the barbershop. And the next day, he got to work early before the shop opened, and he prayed. He said, God, I'm going to serve you. Give me. Give me an opportunity. Just give me one opportunity to share the gospel with somebody today, and I'll make you proud. Well, 8 o'clock came. He opened the barbershop. First dude that walked in was the most scariest, arneriest, ugliest, meanest, biggest, tatted all up dude he had ever seen. Yeah, kind of like Pastor Dwayne. Uh, he ever seen in his life. Ever. I mean, this guy was big and, and topped that off. He was all jacked up and mad. Come find out, he had lost a bet with some of his biker buddies, and because he lost the bet, he had to go in and get his head shaved. So Bob the Barber's thinking, God, this ain't going to work. This ain't going to work. And, and he realized he couldn't say a word, so he didn't. And this guy left, and then he started to feel a little guilty because he promised God he would. Next customer comes in, he didn't say a word. Next customer, all day long, he hasn't done what he told God he was going to do. So by 5 o'clock when he's getting ready to close the shop, he's kind of riddled with guilt and shame that he had told God he was going to do it, and he didn't do it. There was nobody in the shop, so he got on his knees, and he said, God, I'm so sorry. Give me one more opportunity. Give me one more opportunity. If you do, I'll make you proud. And so as soon as he said that, this really pleasant guy comes walking in the shop apologizing that he's coming in so late in the day. But he really would like to have a shave and a haircut. And he asked, uh, can you do that? And Bob said, sure, sit down in the chair. He sat down in the chair. Bob put the drape around him, and he realized, oh, I can't remember. I don't remember any one of the scriptures. Oh, I, I, I can't remember how you start the conversation. I don't remember any of the answers to the questions. Oh, man, and he just got so confused, and he's, he's sharpening or cleaning this. You know how they do with the razor on that rubber strap, on that leather strap? He's doing that, and he's worried to death, and he's worried to death. But, man, he made a promise to God. So he spins the guy around in the chair while he's holding the razor, and he goes, Are you ready to die? <laughs> That's not how you witness. There was this elderly guy that wanted to know what was going on in his church because, you know, he thought there were some shady things going on. He wanted to make sure that everything was on the up and up. So he attended the church business meeting. And there's about 75 people there. And one committee chairman after the other got up and gave a report on how things were going in, in, in worship and how things were going with the children's ministry and how things were going in finances. And finally, this one guy gets up, and he's the chairman of the evangelism committee. And he says, I want you to know, folks, that we have studied the problem and we've come to figure out now that there are at least 75 homes in our county that don't own a Bible. And everybody went, ah. Oh. And the old man in the back of the building, he raised his hand and stood up and said, I got a question for the chairman of the evangelism committee. And they said, sure, what's your question? He goes, how did you arrive at that number? And how did you arrive at that answer? And the chairman, he's kind of excited because somebody wanted to know what he'd done. So he stood up and he says, I can tell you that, brother. He says, we did a survey. We went to every house in the county and asked them if they had a Bible in their house. And I want you to know, at least 75 homes don't because they were willing to admit it to us. 
He says, then we kind of walked around the, the town square, around the market area, and we asked people if they had a Bible. And we kept keeping all this data. And then we came back here to the church, and we put it all together on a spreadsheet in Excel, and we looked at it, and we thought about it, and we went out and talked to some more people, and we, can't, and we know now there's at least 75 homes that don't have a Bible. And the old man says, well, you know, that seems like a lot of wasted effort and time to me. There's 75 people in this room. If everybody in this room took one Bible to one family, everybody would have a Bible in their house. This ain't no church. Churches don't do this kind of thing. You've wasted too much energy and time. You're more concerned with your programs than you are with reaching people with the gospel. And you know what? He's right. Sad thing is that what I just told you happens time after time after time right here in the city of Portsmouth. Churches make observations and do surveys and do studies instead of getting off their butt and going out and telling people about Jesus. You know I'm right. You know I'm right. We started a series last weekend. Pastor John actually started it for me because of my eye surgery. We're calling Mission Possible. And Pastor John, he did a great job last week, didn't he? Give him a hand. He's not here, but give him a hand anyway. There you go. Hey, John. He's watching on, online, so there you go. But he started off the series by talking about some, some key essential things we need to understand about evangelism. And then he finished, he wrapped up the day talking about some ways that we can evangelize people. And what I want to do this morning is probably the most simple thing I've ever talked about. I want us to look at what's called by a lot of people the Roman road, which is simply just a very easy way to help people find Jesus, a very easy way to help us go out and share Jesus with other people. Now, let me ask you a question before I get too far into this. How many of you here would consider yourself an evangelist? Raise your hand. We have a full room and four people raise their hand. I just want the people online to know that. Four people raise your hand. Most people have, have notions of what evangelist means, right? I do. And I'm jacked up, you know, and my ADD kicks in. But all of us probably associate the word evangelism with the word that follows it. TV, television, uh, radio, crusades. With my mind, mine goes all the way from one side to the other. Because when I think of evangelist, I think of Billy Graham on the podium. Oh! Okay? All the way to the jerk on Atlantic Avenue standing on a milk crate telling me that I'm going to hell. And everything in between, that's an evangelist. But the fact of the matter is, if we are followers of Jesus, if we say we have a relationship with the God that created us, we ought to be evangelists. We ought to be evangelizing. You understand that word evangel? You know what it means? It means the good news. It means the gospel. We should be willing to, we should be wanting to, we should be motivated to bring the good news to people. So this morning what I want to talk about is how do we do that? I'm going to lay out a simple plan for us that I believe we can follow. Because I know this about every one of you in this room. You've got somebody in your life, a friend or a family member, a work acquaintance or somebody who if this very moment took their last breath on this planet, they'd go to hell because they don't have a relationship with Jesus. We've got to make sure that we do what we can to help those people, our friends, our family, people we do life with, to make sure they get to spend eternity with the God that created them. Somebody did that for you. Somebody did that for you. Amen? All right. So what I want to do in, is just be very plain and, and very simple uh, and walk through that. Now, let me stop right here for a second. Listen, if you're here this morning, and if you were honest, you're not even sure God's real. If you're here this morning and you're not sure if you want to ask Jesus to be a part of your life, you're not sure if the whole idea of, of Christianity is right for you, what I would encourage you to do this morning 
is listen to what I have to say with an open mind. Because at the end of this morning, I want you to make a decision. I want you to make a decision. Not one of us is guaranteed tomorrow. Quite honestly, not one of us is guaranteed the next minute. And what we do in terms of a decision we make or don't make for God will affect our eternity. So listen to me with an open mind. That's what I'm asking you to do. And I'm trusting that God through Holy Spirit is going to move in your life. The Roman road is something that, that pastors and churches have referred to for years. It's just a simple road map. Now, we're going to be in the book of Romans, okay? Which should be very familiar to all of you. For those of you that are new or, or maybe haven't been here in a while, we spent the first 14 weeks of 2019 literally walking through the book of Romans, okay? We've looked at every chapter in the book of Romans. We've looked at this letter that, that Paul wrote to the churches at Rome. And as if we didn't know enough about Rome and Romans, we're going to be back there today, okay? Because the Roman road is simply a method to help people find Jesus to help us understand who we are that Paul laid out. Now, the trick is, it didn't go in chronological order as he wrote the book of Romans. He kind of bounces all over. So we'll be bouncing all over. But this is a simple but literally powerful way of explaining why we need Jesus. This is a simple and powerful way of explaining God's solution to that, to that problem we have of, of not being good enough. This is a simple and powerful way of us understanding who we are who God is, and what eternity is all about. So I think it's important for us to, to be able to walk through this because the truth is, if we're honest, most of us who have a relationship with God, we want to be evangelists. We would love to be able to sit down with our best friend on this planet and share Jesus with them. But the truth is, most of us are scared to do that because most of us feel like we don't know enough. And let me tell you what. You think that way because Satan's whispering in your ear who you think you are. You ain't good enough. And guess what? That's a lie. That's a lie because all he is is a liar. God wants us to share him with everybody. And that's what I want us to do. You ever heard the term, all roads lead to Rome? You know why that's a, ro a, a term? Because during the Roman Empire, literally, uh, the, the empire, Rome, built roads from their border to the major cities throughout the world, to the major areas throughout the world, all over Europe and all over Asia. So quite honestly, you could get on a road and end up in Rome. So I think it's just a, 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 a appropriate that we call this pathway we're going to look at the Roman road. How many of you got your Bibles? Old school, new school, raise them up. Let me see them. We are a people. I want us to be a people who are in God's word. I want us to be a people who read God's word. And guess what? You've got to have it to read it, you know? And God don't care if it's on a tablet, your smart device, or it's in a bound book. But we need to be reading it. I tell folks around here all the time, don't believe what I tell you. How do you know if I'm going to lead you down a Pimrose path or not? Don't listen to what I say. Go out and find it out for yourself. If I tell you God says such and such, go prove it for yourself. Don't believe what I tell you. Believe what's in God's word. You got your outlines? Let's go ahead and jump into it. The first stop on the Roman road is something I call our condition. Our condition. You see, the truth be told, every one of us is jacked up. Okay, we are all jacked up. This is the perfect place to start. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care how much money or education you have. I don't care how many times you've been to jail. I don't care if you've been to federal prison. I don't care if you're an axe murderer. You are jacked up just like all of us. Okay, here's why. The moment you take your first breath on this planet, you have a sin nature. And that sin nature separates you from a holy God. And there's nothing you can do about it. You ain't good enough. You will never be good enough. So get over yourself. Boy, that's so powerful, isn't it? That is so powerful. But the truth is this. We ain't good enough. We'll never be good enough. Okay? 
Sin separates us from a holy God. But God loves us so much that before he created us, he knew that Adam and Eve would fall. He knew that sin would enter the world. He knew that every human being born after them would be born with a sin nature. So he knew he had to fix the problem. And he fixed it before he ever created it. It's called the plan of reconciliation. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's talk about our condition. Most people think they're good enough. Most people deep down inside say, I'm a good person. You know, if we were to weigh on a scale my bad crap and my good crap, the good crap would win. But you know what? There's a lot of people that are good that are in hell. And there's a lot of people on this planet at this very moment that are good that if nothing changes, they will go to hell. Because being good enough ain't enough. It's not enough, period. Paul said in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. How many people are righteous? None. 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 Paul said, regardless of what you think about yourself, regardless of how good you believe you to be, you ain't. A little bit further down in the same chapter, Paul said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many sinned? All. And all means all, right? You know, we don't use these kind of words in our everyday talk. How many of you in the last week have talked about being righteous? Now, there are some things, okay? Let's be honest. Bacon is righteous. And anything that has bacon on it becomes righteous, okay? But that's a different kind of righteousness, all right? And another thing, my mama used to make the most righteous chocolate cake on this planet. But that's not the same thing, okay? It's not the same kind of righteousness. So we don't use that in our vocabulary a lot. And, and we usually don't talk about sin a lot either. Okay, but when we talk about righteous and righteousness, what we're talking about simply is this. If, if we're righteous, that means we are good enough for God. That means that we are being right for God. Okay, and when we talk about sin, we're talking about the stuff that causes us to fall short of perfection. Sin causes us to fall short of perfection. And like I said a lot of people think they're good. And if you talk to most people, they don't see themselves as sinners. In fact, when they think of somebody that's a sinner, they think of somebody that's just dangerous, somebody that's violent, somebody that's disgusting, somebody that's a drunk, somebody that cusses like a sailor, somebody that does anything other than what they do. Because when you ask them, they don't think they're sinners. They tend to think that's somebody else. And even though they think they're good, you won't find anybody that says, I'm perfect. And guess what? If you ain't perfect, you're a sinner. Think about that. Most of us will say we're not perfect. So if you're not perfect, you're a sinner. Because in order to be perfect, Every thought has to be pure. Every word has to be pure that comes out of your mouth. And let's be honest, I can guarantee you most of us this morning have said something that wasn't pure. Every deed has to be pure. Jesus told us to be perfect as his Father in heaven's perfect. But I'm not sure in our own, in fact, I am sure in our own, we can't be perfect, you know. I mean, you think of it this way. I think about archery. Anybody ever shot a bow and arrow? It ain't the easiest thing in the world. But man, you ever seen them guys that are doing, ladies too, that are doing archery in the Olympics? Oh my gosh. I mean, what, their bow looks like a computer, right? And they stand there and they do all the stuff they do. And almost every time, almost every time, the arrow goes in the bullseye. If they were perfect, the arrow would go in the bullseye every time. 
Think about basketball, man. Think about Magic Johnson and, and all those guys that were just amazing back in the day. Michael Jordan. Oh, my gosh. I saw a picture the other day of Michael Jordan dunking the ball. And they said it was a famous picture. I hadn't seen it before. But literally, it looks like he is literally six or seven feet off the ground. His head and shoulders are above the rim as he's doing this. In order for Michael Jordan, who was the most amazing basketball player to ever play the game, to be perfect, he'd have had to make every shot he ever attempted every three-point he ever attempted, every foul shot he ever attempted, never fouled anyone in playing the game. Pastor Jay and, and Miss Dawn, their next-door neighbor they used to have when they lived in Suffolk, uh, they had a young boy, young man. He's not a young man anymore. His name is Brandon Lau. Brandon played baseball all his life growing up. Brandon played baseball in college. Brandon got picked up by the Tampa Bay Rays. He played, uh, you know, the AAA ball like the Tides for a couple of years. Brandon now starts for the Rays. Brandon was given a $24 million six-year contract earlier this year. Brandon was hitting somewhere close to 300, which is amazing in the majors. Amazing. Last time I checked, he'd already had eight home runs this year and we're only a month into the season. Amazing, right? But even with a 300 average, you know what that means? You know what that means? That means two-thirds of the time when he gets up to the bat, he strikes out. That ain't perfect. NASCAR, my favorite sport. In order to be perfect, you'd have to win every race you ever started, and nobody's that good. Even King Richard Petty wasn't that good. Nobody is perfect. Everybody is flawed. Everybody is a sinner. You know what the real problem with sin is? You know what the real problem is? It's deadly. That's what the problem is. Sin is deadly. I mean, I left probably the most important scripture, and I got to admit, I'm not perfect. I screwed up. I left the most important scripture reference out of your outline and out of the PowerPoint, and I realized it yesterday. And I wasn't about to tell Holly or Sue yesterday that I had screwed up. So I'm going to stand up here and tell y'all, I screwed up, okay? So in the margin of your outline, I want you to write down this reference, Romans 6.23, okay? Romans 6.23. And the reason I say this is probably one of the most important scriptures, it talks about the consequences of sin. And the thing I looked at, I went and looked in the New Living Translation, in the Living Bible, in the American Standard Bible, in the NIV Bible, and also in the King James, five different translations. And word for word, this is exactly what all five of them say. For the wages of sin is death. Okay? And then I went and looked at the message. I like the message because it's, it's simple. It's a paraphrase. I can understand it like the children's Bible. It's, it's cool, right? But I looked at the message translation. Listen to what it says. Work hard for sin your whole life, and your pension is death. So encouraging. Awesome. The wages of sin is death. The deadliest killer in the world is not cancer. It's not heart disease. It's not AIDS. It's not even war. The deadliest killer in the world is sin. And here's the catch. There's no vaccine you can take to get rid of it. There's nothing you can do. Sin is an epidemic that not one person on this planet can avoid. Past, present, future. And this sickness is always 100% perfectly terminal. It is. There's no exceptions. None whatsoever. So the first stop on our trip down the road of Romans is this. Our condition. And our condition is pretty dismal. Our condition is horrible. And if we stopped here, the Roman roads would be a dead end. But thank God it's not. Because the second stop on the road to Rome is God's solution. 
Yeah, we're jacked up. Every one of us is jacked up. We're not good enough. We're not righteous. We're not perfect. We all have sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Go on and on and on. The wage of sin and death. All that's true. God knew that before he created man. So he placed a solution in place before he said, let there be light. And that solution was Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, Romans 5, 8 explains that God loved us so much, so much that he sent his son Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, because Jesus was God incarnate. Jesus was God in man and he sent him to die on a cross as a sacrifice for my sin and your sin and every other person's sin who has ever breathed a breath of life on this planet now you guys know I have ADD right so I'm going to talk about a movie I'm just going to go I'm going to talk about a movie for a minute I want you to be in a movie I want you to be the movie stars you're in a, the next big blockbuster disaster movie, okay? And here's what's going to happen. Here's the plot. There is a meteor the size of Texas headed towards the earth. And it is projected to hit dead center of the continental United States. It will take out most of North America, if not all, and most of Central America, if not all. There's nobody that's going to help you get away from this. I mean, if you're waiting on government, well, you know how government is. The military can't do it. What are they going to do, shoot it? You know? Fire department's going to sit there and go, well, it's going to just squash all our trucks. There's nothing you can do. But wait, there is. Because there's always a, an escape in a disaster movie. Here it is. You got to run to the West Coast. It's only 3,000 miles. Don't laugh. You got to run to the West Coast. People on the West Coast ain't got to run at all. You got to get to the West Coast. And then you got to swim to Hawaii. It's not a big deal. It's only 2,500 miles. So now imagine this. You're at the West Coast. You're standing side by side with people who are dorkier than you, but people who are stronger than you. Because standing side by side with you are some of the military's finest. Special Forces, Green Berets, SEALs, Navy SEALs, Olympic swimmers, and people from the nursing home. Okay? And you got to swim to Hawaii. The fact of the matter is, some people, the moment they get in the water, they're going to drown. Okay? The undercurrent's going to get them, under they go. Okay? But the truth of the matter is, sooner or later, ain't nobody going to make it. Ain't nobody going to make it. The strongest may last a little longer. I have the gift of encouragement. But they're going to die too. Okay? That's the fact. And in the same way, none of us can make it to heaven on our own. I don't care if you're a baby, a baby, a baby person who doesn't believe or somebody who is a steadfast, hardcore, anti God, you're not going to make it on your own. You're not going to make it on your own. You're going to die. Just like the people in this movie. That's why Jesus came in the first place. God sent Jesus as a solution to our condition. Okay? God sent Jesus as our sacrifice. God sent Jesus, let's go back to the movie. Jesus is a bridge from California to Hawaii. Okay? I told you I got ADD. Just roll with me here, okay? Jesus is a bridge from California to Hawaii. The Hampton Roads Elizabeth River Commission doesn't own the bridge, so there's no toll. You don't have to have a smart pass, okay? All you got to do is get out of the water and get on the bridge. That's all you got to do. 
and yeah, walk 2,500 miles to Hawaii, okay? But ignore the walking piece, okay? It's free. There's no toll. But it'll do you no good if you don't get out of the water. It'll do you no good whatsoever if you don't go get on the bridge. Now, before I go any farther, we're going to take a left turn on the Roman road. Because there's a verse of scripture that's not in Romans that you need to hear. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay, so far along the road we've talked about our condition and our condition is pretty jacked up, okay? We can't do anything for ourselves. But now we've talked about God's solution to this problem, okay? He's got a way. It's a bridge. We can avoid disaster. If we get on the bridge. Now that brings us to the third stop in our trap. And that is our response. Because you see that's the most important thing. How are we going to respond to this? How are we going to do it? You see Jesus is offering us salvation. And he's offering it to us as a free gift. We ain't got to pay for. But I'm going to tell you what. It ain't going to do us any good whatsoever. If we choose not to accept it. If we choose not to go down that path, it's not going to do us any good. And that brings us back to the Roman roads. Ro Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to respond. It's on us. We have to make the decision. Actually, quite honestly, we, uh, there are several responses that we have to make. And I'll put them in your outline. The first one is faith. The first one is faith, putting trust in God. we got to put trust in God. And, you know, I, I've been around the church a long time, and I've heard a lot of people talk about faith. And I'm going to tell you what, people have as many definitions for what faith is as there are people. But they really kind of fall into two or three categories. One of them is what I call fuzzy faith, because I'm not sure they're sure what they have faith in. You ask them what they have faith in, and they say things like, oh, my faith will get me through. But when I go, what do you have faith in? Well, it's going to get me through. It's going to get me through. And, and to me, we go back to our movie, those are people living in the water that don't believe the bridge exists. It's there, but they don't see it, okay? And then there are people that get a little bit more specific with their idea of what faith is. Well, what kind of faith do you have? I believe in God. They may even say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. But again, they're like people in the water. They say, I believe the bridge exists. I believe the bridge is right there. I believe the bridge will keep me safe. But they're still in the water swimming. Faith does them no good. You see, the faith we got to have is what I call saving faith. And, 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 and saving faith is that faith that says, I believe and I'm going to do something about it. It's the faith that motivates us to action. It's faith that doesn't keep us standing still, but it keeps us moving. It's faith that causes me to get out of the water and get on the bridge. That's saving faith. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Can't you see that? Can't you understand that? And we go, well, yeah, maybe, so, yeah, kind of. You see, Paul is saying here that we have to be careful or we can be in contempt of God's riches. We can hold it in contempt. But see, God is being patient with us. God is being tolerant with us. And because of that, we need to exercise our faith. And our faith needs to have some legs. And we need to do something. We need to get out of the water and, and get on the bridge. The second response that I think we have to have is just as important. And that response is, is basically, let me get over to it there, our, our repentance. Our repentance. And that's turning away from sin. Now, now, now let, me, let me kind of, 
let me kind of explain this a little bit. If we have saving faith, we're going to want to do something. And what we see is our condition. And we've already said our condition is messed up, right? So if we have saving faith, then what we want to do is turn away from our sin. But that creates a void. That creates a vacuum. So we turn away from our sin and turn towards Jesus. We turn away from our sin and turn towards Jesus. It's a conscious decision that we're going to trust him. It's a conscious decision that we're going to follow him. It's a conscious decision that we're going to obey him. Trust, obey. Trust, obey. There's a song. It goes, trust and obey, for there's no other way than to be happy in Jesus, but to try. You know, first service was full of Baptists. They knew the song. <laughs> trust and obey, okay? That's repentance. That's Saving faith. That's moving forward. Next thing we got to do is what I call confession. Now, it's not like going to church and confession to the priest or anything. Confession is whole different. It's calling out to God. It's calling out to God. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved. Let's stop right there. Stop right there. Because you know what? It doesn't say you'll be in a lottery and those whose lucky numbers get picked, they get saved. It doesn't say you, you might get saved if God feels like it. It doesn't say you could be saved if you do enough good stuff. What does it say? You will be saved. That's emphatic. That's emphatic. If you do this, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Understand there's a, there's a confession there, the with the mouth part. Declaring that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That's confession. Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Confession turns thought into action. Confession lets other people know what's happening inside of you. Confession lets people understand where you are with the Lord. It is a public commitment. How many of you have ever been to a wedding? How many of you have ever been to a wedding? How many of you have been married? Got most of you, right? So you've seen that happen, right? Whether it was a civil ceremony or a church ceremony, at some point, sometime, the person who's officiating looks at the groom and says, will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Right? What do you think would happen if the groom said, hey, ain't none of your business? That's between me and her. Don't you think, I'm not putting my stuff on the street. Would the wedding continue? It probably would stop right there. <laughs> Screeching halt. You know, all kinds of worries would happen, right? But that's not what you do. When, the, when whoever's officiating the wedding asks you, your response is, I do or I will, right? Confession is to salvation what vows are to a wedding. Okay? When you take Jesus as your Savior, when you ask him to come into your life, when you become a follower of him, you can't keep it secret. You can't. With your mouth, you confess. With your heart, you believe. And the result is salvation. The next part of our response is baptism. And that's identifying with Jesus. That's identifying with Jesus. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, you were joined in his death? 
For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by his glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we, also, we will also be raised to life as he was. When you look at this little piece of scripture here, Paul gives this wonderful description of another response associated with saving grace, and that's baptism. You see, he says in baptism, we identify with Jesus' death, we identify with Jesus' burial, and we also identify with his resurrection. Baptism is a picture of the story of salvation. It's really what it is, you know. It's going under the water. You're representing the fact that you are dying, that you're dying to your old life. You're dying to your old ways. When you come up out of the water, it represents you are a new creature, a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the Bible says, all things become new. What I've come to realize is that, that baptism is the line of demarcation between your old life and your new life. Now, listen to me. Don't get confused. Don't say and walk out of here saying, Pastor Steve said that baptism saves you. I didn't say that. Baptism is a public proclamation of the faith you have in Jesus. It's a result of the faith in action. It's a result of the saving faith that I'm talking about. Your baptism isn't an end to anything. It is the very beginning of your new life with Jesus. You see, we're going to be followers of his, which brings me to the next point in this. The next response is following Jesus, living the new life, living the new life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You see, baptism in itself is nothing. But when we do it as an act of worship to God, it's amazing. You are giving your body as a living sacrifice to God. We believe with our heart and we confess with our mouth. And in baptism, you offer all yourself to God, spirit, mind, and body. And then you keep doing that every single day, every single day. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the second verse in that chapter says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, our life of faith involves a renewing of our mind. It involves us offering God All of us. And you know what? We don't do it one time. We do it daily. We give him us daily. And if we do that, our connection with God is going to remain fresh. It's going to feel new every single day throughout the rest of our lives. So our first stop on the Roman road was our condition, which is pretty jacked up. The second stop on the Roman road was God's response, God's solution to our problem. And then the third response was our own response. How do we act because of this? And that brings us to the fourth point, the fourth stop on the road, and that's God's promise. God's promise. See, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, I love this verse. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I just love the 8th chapter. There's just so much good stuff in here. No condemnation. Nobody can condemn me for what God has done to me and through me. When we have a relationship with the God that created us, nobody can stand up against that. Nobody can. The truth is, not one of us follow Jesus perfectly because even though he's in our life, and even though we have a relationship with him, we're still human. And we still have a sin nature to deal with on a daily basis. So none of us follow Jesus perfectly. But you don't have to go around wondering every single day if you really belong to God or not. Because it ain't up to you. 
it was never up to you. See, we don't put our trust in ourselves. We place our trust in him. We depend on him. And he, I can guarantee you, is for us. 100% perfectly for us. Romans 8, chapter 31 says, <clears throat> What then shall we say in response to these things? I love this. If God is for us, who can be against us? See, I no longer have to wonder if God's on my side. When I asked Jesus to come into my life, God took a permanent residence on my side. He's got my back, my front, and my sides. He's there, right? I don't have to worry about that. So listen, you can take this to the bank. Next time you feel anxious, if you have a relationship with Jesus, next time you feel anxious, next time you feel hopeless, next time you feel helpless, next time you feel lonely, remember God's got your back. God is on your side. He's there for you. See, Romans chapter 8 is just so full of encouragement. We didn't get to camp out in Romans chapter 8 when we were going through this, the, the, stu the study like I wanted to. I think we spent about three weeks in Romans. We could have spent three months. It's an amazing, an amazing chapter. Here's what I'm doing. I want to challenge you. This week, instead of whatever it is you normally do, if you have a quiet time, if you spend some time reading your Bible, here's what I want to challenge you to do. Read Romans chapter 8 this week. Read it today. Read it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. When you do that, you've read it seven times. Wow, that's the number of perfection. Well, you're not going to get perfect reading it, okay? But I'll guarantee you it'll change your life. It'll change your life. And I want to challenge you to do that. I also want to challenge you to do something else. I want to challenge you to become an evangelist. I want you to take this sermon, these notes, and make them yours. I said earlier, I'm going to say it again, everybody here knows somebody. If they don't tell them about Jesus, they will die and go to hell. God is not a God of disorder. You know that person for a reason. God put that person in your life for a reason. What I want to challenge you to do is to get up the courage to share Jesus with them. You don't have to be the obnoxious preacher on the street corner, okay? And I can tell you right now, you're not going to be Billy Graham either, okay? Maybe you'll be a little bit better than Bob the Barber. <laughs> but I challenge you. I challenge you. God put those people in your life for a reason. And maybe that reason is to share Jesus. You don't need to say everything I said. You don't need to use every, every illustration I used this morning. And you just need to know it follows a simple, methodical process. We're all sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. God loves us so much, he created a plan to draw us back to him through his son, Jesus. Our role and our responsibility is to accept that. And if we accept that, God's going to bless us. That's it, guys. That's it. That's it. It's that simple. Maybe you're at a crossroads this morning. Maybe you're here, and I said that earlier too. Maybe you're not even sure if God's real. Maybe you're here because people just wouldn't shut up and get off your back. But listen to me. You need to hear me say to you that God loves you. That if you don't choose, you've made a choice. Here's the deal. I've had people ask me this before too. What, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? What if there's no God? What if Jesus wasn't the Messiah? When I die, what have I lost? Nothing. What if I'm right? What if I'm right and you're wrong and you die? What have you lost? Everything. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for the road to Romans.
Father, I pray right now that the folks here in this building this morning will have the courage and love the people that are in their life so much that they won't worry about what they think about them, but instead they will have the courage through Holy Spirit to share the gospel of Jesus with them. Father, give them everything they need and make up the difference between what they're capable of doing and saying and what you need to have done and said for the folks that are in their lives. I thank you. I thank you for what's going to happen because of that. Now keep your eyes closed for just a minute. If there is somebody here who's listened to this sermon and you're not sure, let me help you. I believe with everything that is in me that God loves you and that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. God did all the work for you. He's built a bridge to save you from disaster. All you got to do is get out of the water and get on the bridge. And you can do that by praying a very simple prayer. So in the quietness of this moment, I'm going to pray that prayer. I'm encouraging you to pray it with me. You can pray it silently. Nobody has to know. Or if you feel compelled to scream it at the top of your lungs, go for it. But pray something like this. God, I need you. I realize I am hopelessly lost without you. I've done a lot of bad things in my life, and I am nowhere close to righteous. I got a lot of what people call sin in my life, and I confess that to you right now. And what I'm going to do, God, with all the faith all the saving faith that I can bring together right now in this moment, I'm going to say to you, I believe you love me. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die for me. I believe Jesus took on my sin and he sacrificed his life for me. And because of that, I'm asking you right now to establish a relationship with me to come into my life right now, this very moment, I don't know what to do next, but I know this is the starting point, and I'm doing it, God, and I pray that you honor it in Jesus' name, amen.